Do you know how to criticize someone in a constructive way and not a destructive one? How to discipline in a way that motivates and doesn't demoralize? This is a critical, no pun intended, issue that affects us all. Think about how you were criticized, how you were disciplined by parents, by educators, by others. What does it make you feel like? Very often, it breaks a person. It's debilitating, it's demoralizing. On the other hand, should we ignore something that needs discipline, that may need constructive critique? Where's the balance? So please join me in this very important discussion, perhaps today more vital than ever. How to criticize without shaming, how to discipline without yelling. Hi everyone, Simon Jacobson here, and welcome. Our topic, an important topic, critical topic is how to criticize without shaming, how to discipline without yelling. This program is an honor and a happy birthday to Ashley Rose, Danielle, and Rich Kirk, and a loving memory of David Elio Ben Avram Yitzchok on the 11th of Adar. Do you know how to criticize, how to discipline in a constructive way? Or does it demoralize another person? Think of it the other way around, when you've been criticized. And let's go back even to our childhood. Parents, educators, others. How did it make you feel? Did it motivate you to grow? Or did it demoralize you? Did it break your spirit? And that is the vital litmus test to know whether the critique, whether the discipline is being done in the proper fashion. It's something we don't look closely enough at because it's so easy, our knee-jerk reactions. Someone does something, even if you're not that judgmental, we'll talk about judgmentalism in a moment, there's sometimes that just reaction, you're annoyed, you're disturbed, so you say something very dismissive, And you're not really thinking about it, and you end up actually not really helping the problem. Especially if you also include judgmentalism, which unfortunately many of us have. Then there's also that element of, uh, say, condescension is a strong word. But in general, a type of element of judging another. So, of course, your critique is going to also be in that same spirit. Now, there's also the other extreme. There are people, something happens, and they ignore it. Now, many things we should ignore. There are a lot of things that we should just, we should just move on, be resilient, and that's that. But there are areas in life where we need to address it. Your child comes home from school and did something really not appropriate. Hit another child, bullied. So there are parents who will just say, it's never my child. It's the other child, it's their parents, it's the school, it's the principal, it's, it's God, whatever. The other extreme are the disciplinarian parents. They hear something, they right away ground the child. And what, is it ha- what happens? You break the spirit of the child, you demoralize the child. Okay, one time we all make mistakes. But if this is repeated, you're literally hurting your own child in the name of discipline. Is there a third approach? Absolutely. And that's the purpose of this discussion. It requires, however, deliberating, being deliberate, being reflective, being thoughtful, not just reacting. Because just as it is in, let's take it in medicine, the problem, any problem, any symptom is one thing. You can nip it in the bud, hopefully, and eliminate it. One of the worst problems is the problem that comes as a result of the problem, how you deal with it. If you deal with something the wrong way, with an infection, you make the problem far worse. There's no doubt, and I see it from my own experience over the years, 
that most problems, interpersonal problems between parents and children, between siblings, between uh, spouses, between friends, between the companies, between the colleagues, co-workers, strangers, is not always the initial problem, it's the reaction to the problem. I was just dealing with a situation where a family discovered, unfortunately, one of their children was diagnosed with bipolar. The way they handled it was so unhealthy, it made it far worse. So it's like one thing, there's a fire. Fine, let's contain it. Let's stop the bleeding as much as we can and deal with it. But what happens if the father reacts in one way and the mother in another? One goes into denial. One goes into complete distortions. All because of their discomfort. So then you're projecting your stuff and making the problem far bigger. We don't even realize how often we contribute to putting fuel on the fire. We may have good intentions. I'm not questioning that. But are you doing the right thing? So reacting to something is as equally, as equally, is equally important, if not more important, than the initial issue. I mean, there's that very strong statement about uh, abuse, that the silence was worse than the rape. And I apologize if it offends anyone, those terms. The point I want to make, the silence is worse than the crime. The crime is bad enough, but then silence, invalidation, it never happened. Let's move on. That can be far more devastating. In our context, something may require discipline, something may require some reaction, but often the reaction brings our personality into it. So point number one is think about, are you considering the good of the situation, the person you are trying to discipline or criticize? And we'll talk in a moment whether you're even that person. But let's assume you're the parent, you're the responsible party. Are you thinking about what is going to be best in the situation or are you bringing your own personality into it? Maybe your anger, maybe your resentment, maybe just your natural wiring or your nurture or nature style of attitude. You know, you get upset at something. That's step number one. Stop yourself. The first thing is always pause and reflect. What is the best way to deal with this? Strategize. You don't have to deal with it immediately. Now, of course, there are emergencies you need to deal with. Fine, so you deal with the emergency. But any type of discipline of a child, of someone where you're responsible, needs to be thought through. And most importantly, not just to think through what's the best way to deal with it, but also to think through that you are not bringing yourself into the equation and somewhat distorting the picture. That's not what you want. It's not about you. It's about the situation. As a writer... I deal with editors. Now, some writers hate editors because editors, they say, are failed writers and they're trying to impose their themselves through my writing by editing me. I've heard this. I actually love editors. I write something, I'd love an editor to to rip it apart and make it better. Obviously, it should maintain the spirit and the integrity of the original. But I see the dynamic often is one where sometimes editors do have issues. And they're not just editing to make it better. They are somewhat inserting themselves into the picture. When people send me something, I always my first question is, what do they want to achieve? Not what I want to achieve. This is not my outlet. This is that person's writing. Like we talk about book reviews. Many people criticize a book, what the book is not. You have to look at what the goal of the author was and did he or she achieve that goal. Think about the product. Think about what you're addressing, not about you. If you would have written the book, you would have done it differently. Fine, you're entitled to say that. But that's not addressing the the, the issue at hand. So it's vital that when we bring any type of critique and judgment, I'm going to say the word judgment, I don't like judgment, critique, and and, and something to discipline, it should be, don't insert yourself in it. Now, is it inevitable that we're going to insert part of ourselves? Obviously. But as much as possible, try to reflect, try to deliberate, and stop yourself and say, what is going to be good for my child who came home from school and bullied someone or hit someone? What is going to be best for this child? And we'll talk about the actual intervention. But first, your attitude and yourself. What is your role? Now, it's critical, critical disclaimer. Not everything is our job to criticize or to discipline. You have to also make that clear. Just because someone did something wrong, yes, if they're a danger to others, you should alert people. 
that's an obligation and a humane thing to do. But if it's not something dangerous to anyone else and you see something, do you always have to be the one that has to address it? Now, there are things where you see someone hurting someone. I once wrote an article. I was at a restaurant and I saw a family sitting and it was very clear that there was a lot of dysfunctionality and there was, the father was really berating his child. I, was, I literally almost began to cry how, and I could tell this was he was doing in public. What is he doing at home? And I really debated, should I say anything? I, I didn't know these people. And I wrote a whole article about back and forth. On one hand, I could have gone over, but then the father and the mother and the parents would say, what are you mixing into our business? Who are you? Would that have helped? Or should I have done it anyway? Or should I have found some more diplomatic or gentle way to do it? Talk to the father separately. I end up not doing anything, and I'm not saying I was right. It could have been my own discomfort. But I was thinking, what do you do in a case like that? So there are situations that always you have to insert yourself. Sometimes you do. I think it's case by case. I don't think there's a rule. But we're talking about here, if it's a case where you shouldn't be inserting yourself, then that altogether this whole discussion is moot. Because you shouldn't be, you're not the disciplinarian, you're not the criti- criti- critic, and you're not the person who's responsible. But let's, we're talking situations where there are warrants and there's a necessity. You're a parent, you're a boss, you're um, uh, in a position, uh, a principal, uh, an educator, a leader of a community, a rabbi, a clergy. Well, I mean, anyone that's in a position where others are, you're managing others. And there's a need, like in business, there's a need. You're, you have people who are your subordinates and you need to direct them. What happens if someone makes a big mistake? Demoralizing is a destructive force. That's not what you want because it doesn't motivate. It's not an incentive. So the question is, how do you discipline? And how do you address something like we titled this, how to, how to criticize without shaming and how to discipline without yelling? So it's a situation where you, there is a need. Firstly, you're the person. The, there is, firstly, there's a need to criticize or discipline. And secondly, you're the person to do so. So that's a critical disclaimer, a critical uh, a component in this entire discussion. So shaming is a very powerful word here too. Shaming is demoralizing. And a good litmus test, as I said earlier, if you're doing something right, right, right is what, what, how it affects the person. And that's what we need to deliberate on. If you're going to do something, you're going to ground your child, and the child will be broken. I don't just mean they'll cry. I mean, no child likes to be disciplined, even healthy discipline. But you're breaking your the spirit. You need to be very careful not to do that, because that doesn't get, it, get anywhere. On the other hand, to ignore, like we said, is also not an option. So what do you do? And the same thing is with an employer and an employee or a manager and those that work under that person. So the third option, which is not to ignore, because you can't ignore it, because it's an important issue, and you shouldn't ignore it, and also not demoralize and break the spirit of the person. The third option is at the deliberation is not to insert yourself. We stated that. That's clear. But the th- now comes down to this. What will benefit the person most, how will they learn from it? And how will be an incentive that they don't do it again? Now, they may not do it again out of fear because they don't want to be punished. They don't want to be hurt again. That's short term. You, you want to educate them, inspire them, to teach them. So I read somewhere that there was, uh, I think at IBM, a new vice president was hired and he had decisions to make and he made a decision that cost the company a serious loss. 15, 20 million, maybe even more. I don't remember the numbers. And he was sure that's it. He's being fired. He was summoned to his, by his superior. The superior sitting in the desk, and, and this was it. He thought he's getting the axe. And the superior says to him, I'm, I'm reviewing what happened, and I want you to know that we see this as an investment in you. It's a 15, 20 million dollar investment in this mistake you made that you'll learn from it. Not just not to make it again, but to even improve and build this company with your responsibilities. What do you think happened next? Not only was he motivated, he ended up getting, making money for the company that far overshadowed that loss. Hundreds of millions of dollars. That's an example. Now, you could say, one second, maybe he should have been fired. Well, this manager, or this, his, his superior, recognized the talent. 
He didn't just jump. He didn't have the knee-jerk reaction. You know, I hear sometimes employers employ this tactic, something they want to discipline one of their workers. They call them into their office. And of course, the person is ready to hear the worst. And you prepare yourself, and you're all defensive and all of that. And I've heard that they, they, they stand up from their, from their desk, and they tell the person who, did the, who, who uh, caused the problem, they say, please sit in my chair. And they sit in that person's chair and say, if you were the boss and I did this, what would you do? Now, does this always work? It's case by case. But when you think about it, these are all strategies that are empowering, not demoralizing. They're not shaming the person. They're motivating the person. Yes, it's recognizing there's a problem. It's not ignoring it. But the result will be growth, not just more pain, more demoralization, more breaking of the spirit. And the same thing with parents and children. The third approach is you call your child in and say, I heard something happen today. You let your child speak. They may defend themselves, they may not, whatever. And of course, you've established that the facts are true. You don't want to accuse your child of something that's not correct. And the same as in all these situations. That's a given. You don't just jump and criticize before you find out. But you did your discovery. And you say to your child, what do you think about that? And the child says, I'm sorry, I didn't, feel, I didn't think it was right. It was the other person's fault. He started up with me, whatever the reason. But you want to elicit to your child a conversation. Now, I know children are children, not all are ready for a conversation. But the, the gist of it, the spirit of it, what you want to say is, this was really not good. If I did it, I would not want to do it again. What do you think? And the child hopefully will say, yes, I agree. So what do we do about it? Not you make your child a partner, but you're explaining your process and you're not reacting emotionally and reflexively. You're thinking about it. And the child sees that and you say, so here's what I think. I think because you did that, we should take off some time, you know, game time, downtime, whatever it may be, because it's important that you remember that this was done. And my goal is I love you with all my heart. Maybe that should be the opening line. I love you with all my heart and soul. I want you to be the best you can be. You're a flower in my garden. My garden. In God's garden. But I'm the gardener. And I want this flower to grow. I want, I need, we need to get rid of weeds. We all have. I have things that I sometimes need to be corrected. And we need to be reminded. We need to be cognizant and aware of it. So we need to do something. But it's coming from love. Now, not all children may understand the, the, the subtleties and the complexities of this and the nuances, but that's the gist of it. You have to find the right words. Obviously, I'm, and no one size fits all. That's why I'm speaking about it in general terms. But you think about it. What you're doing is you're giving your child an education for life. You're giving your employee. You're giving whoever it is that needs that direction. You're educating them. I remember my mentor, especially my mentor, the Rebbe, he would edit the talks I would prepare when he would speak. My job was to remember it and then write it down. Then he would send it, I would send it in for editing. And it was brutal editing at times, like a scalpel of a surgeon, you know, the sharp, razor sharp mind picking apart. I loved it. I embraced it. There are times he would write shocking. Now, someone else, maybe with a fragile ego or, or thin skin, wouldn't be able to handle it. But to me, it was the growth. I am here today because of that critique. Now, obviously, there were many good things as well. It didn't just come critique. When a coach, you hire a coach, you're the number one tennis player in the world. Or any other athlete, or whatever it may be. And you have a coach. And you get into a funk. Your talent is there, but for whatever reason. You had an injury, you had a loss. The opponent got into your head. What does a good coach do? You pay them to do. They kick you in the pants in a good way. They motivate you. They say you can do it. You don't want them feeding on your own, your own uh, it, it resignation or own uh, lack of confidence and pessimism. You want them to inject you with something. It's the best thing in life to have a good friend. Invite them in and say, I want to hear the truth. Now, obviously, you need someone you trust that you know is not going to just use it as an opportunity to just berate and criticize. But we're so surrounded with that environment where people just need your criticize. Criti you know, the media, it's, it's, it's not thought through. It's entertainment and many times, and it's sensationalism. What we need is the authentic, with integrity way of looking at something. 
And just as it is with yourself, if you're an honest person, you feel you did something wrong, you can also beat yourself up and demoralize yourself. Guilt. Always. You have to say, okay, what did I learn from this? I may have made a big mistake. Maybe I have to say I'm sorry. Maybe I have to correct it as much as possible. But what do I learn from this? I learned from this not to do it again. I learned from this maybe uh, some s- sensitivity I didn't have before. I developed something. Who has not had this situation? I mean, on so many levels this happens. As a person myself who, ha- who has employees and I have a great team that I work with, I employ this all the time. Now, when you make mistakes, of course we'll make mistakes. But there's a dignity that you always want to preserve, the dignity of the person that you are, even when you are have something to say and know how to say it. Now, I'm not talking about avoiding it. Many of us don't like confrontation, so we avoid it, or we tiptoe around it, or we walk on eggshells, and we don't really get the message across. We're talking about getting the message across, but always preserving the dignity of the person, not shaming them, not just in public, even privately. Not yelling, not screaming, but a reaction that is far more constructive and productive. So it takes two key things. One, to deliberate, pause, and think about what you're going to do. And two, make sure that what you do is only there to create growth, to create motivation, to inspire, to make the person better, to make the situation better. And if you do have a rage problem or anger problem and you yell reflexively, you have to work on it. Why is that? Why is the other person guilty? Many of us start saying, you know what? I deserve to be yelled at. I deserve to be demoralized. That's inappropriate. That's inappropriate. You may have done something wrong, but there's a way to deal with it. There's also a healthy way. We don't deal with with a mistake in an unhealthy way. And if you really apply this, it could change your whole way of dealing with people. It's a pleasantness. Because I'm talking about times that require critique or require discipline. But it's all in the spirit of love. What about all the moments of, of great moments? If people remember their parents only for their, critic, crit, for their critique, for their judgment, for their berating, you know what that does. That's the only thing you remember your parents for, or that's the primary thing then you'll always remember it was always love. And even when there were moments, that was my whole experience was love. I heard from my parents' love. I heard from my educators' love. I heard from my employers and from my superiors' love. And even when there was a setback or there was something that needed to be addressed, it was also ultimately a productive approach. And you can understand the contrast for those of us that have been criticized time and again. The demoralization, the cumulative, creates that you start second-guessing yourself. You're not confident. You're not sure of yourself. Difficulty with commitment, with trust. I don't need to spell out all the nightmares that result from sustained negative and unhealthy critique, judgment, discipline. Because what it does is breaks the spirit, yes. So I'd like to focus on the positive, but we have to address both sides of it. So you have in your hands right now, each one of you, Whoever you interact with, and may not always be a, your superior, a teacher, a parent, it could also be a colleague. How you interact can both save a life and shape a life and also unfortunately hurt and destroy the spirit of a person. You never know. You may say something you think it's uh, nonchalant, but that person may have been subject to all types of berating, humiliation, I mean, shame. And you just add it to it. You don't know. So you have to be very careful. And even if, you, even if the person was not subject to that, you need to always do it in a productive and inspiring and motivating way. Humiliation is a, the great greatest crime. Humiliating the dignity of an indispensable divine soul in this world. No person deserves that. Something needs to be addressed, we address it. Sometimes even something needs to be addressed even in strong terms. A criminal. You'll say, Where, what about a criminal? Even a criminal who's prosecuted and for something that really was murder, rape, crimes against humanity. Even there, we need compassion. What does compassion mean? It doesn't mean compassion, you let him off the hook. He may need to go to prison. And sometimes even capital punishment. 
But even that is not because we're getting even. It's not because we're getting our anger out or vengeance. It's because that is what's necessary under the circumstances. It's a bigger topic and I don't really want to digress, but it's the same theme and the same spirit. We're here to build this world. There's an expression in the Bible. It says, judge the people and preserve them and save them. Even when you need to judge them, the purpose is to make them healthier, like a doctor. If you may need to do a puncture, you may need to do an injection, or you may need to do surgery, the goal is healing. The momentary pain is a step toward healing. But imagine the pain is just pain for, for because what? Because something you did something wrong, we're going to cause you pain. That's torture. That's sadism. That's, that's cruelty. So hopefully we can all learn from this. And I include myself because it's our attitude. It's our relationships. And it's what builds ultimately the trust and love that is the essential oxygen, the essential building blocks of what, what makes a human being a human being and what allows us to have thriving, healthy, successful, sustainable, loving relationships and connections. This has been Simon Jacobson. I thank you for listening. Meaningfullife.com is our website. Please go there for a full calendar of programs and events every week, different topics for different types of audiences. Please take advantage. Love to hear from you. Suggestions, feedback, critique, thoughts. And please share this with others. Let's create a ripple effect, a butterfly effect. Pay it forward that continues to carry this message to every person on this earth. And we can. You change one person, you change 10 people, you can change a million people. So let's join together and do that. Thank you so much. Be well. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com donate.